Our next speaker is Dick Sass, and you may remember that Dick spoke to us previously about um, his experiences in World War II. Dick um, has had a very long career in association with aviation. He wants to talk very briefly about an aspect of World War II with, in which he was involved. And I think I met him last time uh, when I introduced him. He was a pretty cunning sort of a glider pilot, and I'll be talking about that as I well. I suppose the, bot the bottom line is I want to give you a little bit of a sense of the pleasure and joy I've had out of gliding. I suppose in some ways it's a poor man's flying, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, that's about the only thing it has in, the, in that particular regard. I wouldn't say it's easier in any way. It's, it's well, it's different. Anyway, I'll talk about gliding. Uh, but before I do, I'll talk just briefly about where I left off last time. Some of you may remember I talked about my experience with test and ferry flight in World War II. I talked about the various aircraft I'd flown, their characteristics. In fact, I had your attention so much that I, I didn't finish. I do owe an apology to Blue Bailey, John Bailey, who's not here today, incidentally his wife is. John says, we heard all that nonsense, but you didn't even speak about the most important aircraft of all, that the P-40 the Kitty Hawk. Well, um, I apologise to John for not talking about the, the Kitty Hawk. The other aircraft I wanted to talk about was the only aircraft I had as an association with a glider. The aircraft was a Wapiti. It was the frontline aircraft of the RAAF in about 1926. So I was lucky to be able to fly it in 1942. It was still around. But my job was to tow a de Havilland glider. I've forgotten what mark it is now. It was very like a de Havilland dragon. It was about the same size and would carry about the same. And I think it had been designed in England. They built two in Australia, um, probably from the English design. But at that stage, it was fairly much in this experimental stages, so my job was to tow this aircraft and see what it did. I had a week, very enjoyable flying, flying this wobbly around with this thing dangling behind, and it, it, was, it worked well, it really did. We passed with flying colours, and I was given the job of flying in a ferry battle. The ferry battle was just a little bit faster, so I got around as far as testing the tow road police. Then I had an opportunity to come on leave to Western Australia, which I grabbed, and that was the end of that particular episode of my gliding. Anyway, to get back to gliding, the first thing I ever had to do with gliding was way back in 1937, 36, quite early. Uh, I think the Perth Gliding Club were operating gliders at Raybold Hill. They would have the glider string, string perhaps yeah, you know about the yeah. uh, well it was a very dangerous looking contraption the pilot stood in the front there was a stick and a wing over the top a group of blokes would pull like heck on a rope and get this thing sliding down the hill there was a bungee attached to it so that when the bungee got so tight the blokes behind couldn't hold it they let go and the thing would spring up if they're lucky they got a 10 or 15 even a minute flight out of it. Then they had to tow the thing up. But that was the, the sort of thing they were doing in 1936. But they were well and truly behind the times was at that stage the Germans particularly had developed gliders to such an extent they were training their Messerschmitt Schmidt pilots on it. Consequently, when the Treaty of Versailles was torn up by Mr. Hitler, they had pilots already trained to fly aeroplanes. That's how good gliders are as trainers. They really are good trainers. One of the reasons is they're stick and rudder aircraft entirely. The reason for that is um, the glider must not have any drag, so the ailerons 
uh, straight aerons, they're not differential. In other words, to fly a glider, you've just got to be a stick and rudder man. And the, you glider pilots will know that very well. Uh, those of us who have done instructing find that that's the first thing we've got to get through to people use the rudder. Anyway, that's, that's a little bit of a side. Uh, but that's a Blanick. A Blanick came out about 40 years ago, I think. Uh, it's, it's a Czechoslovakian aircraft. And I think it was designed partly as a trainer for the Russian Air Force. <coughs> and it is, it is really is an excellent aircraft to fly. <coughs> it has beautifully balanced controls. It's quite sophisticated as far as a glider is concerned. It has a retractable undercarriage, or a retractable wheel, I should say. It also has lift flaps, and it has very powerful spoilers. But above all, it's a beautiful thing to fly. It really is as good as any aircraft I've flown. In fact, the first time I flew, one in 1978, I thought, oh, oh gee, this is the nearest thing that I've flown to a Tiger Moth or a Spitfire, anything that was really <coughs> nice to fly. It was very nice. Um, anyway, unfortunately, the Blanicks reached virtually reached the end of their life, I think about eight, nine months ago, some silly coot in Austria pranged one, ripped the wings off it, and they've been grounded worldwide, and they haven't been released yet. Uh, hopefully they will be. I guess they have been superseded to a certain extent by the fiberglass aircraft. I want to talk a little bit about the weight of gliders and the shape of them. Strangely enough, we've been talking about this very fact recently, most of them are made of fiberglass now. The fact of the matter is they can be made so light that they're not up to their maximum performance. So they can be made quite strong out of carbon fiber, FIP in other words, fiberglass. And even then they're made so light they need to be ballasted. So that is done by putting extra weight in by just water, that's it. So the modern glider has, first of all, it, it's got to be clean. That's as good an aircraft as they come now. It's HW. I'm not too sure which mark it is. But you see, it's beautifully clean all the way up. It's a T-tail. It has winglets. And whereas the Blanick is a beautiful thing to fly, it's not quite as clean as that. The Blanick will have a lift drag ratio or glide ratio of about 28 to 1. This aircraft would probably be 30 or 40 to 1. Not only that, but that aircraft would probably maintain that 30 or 40, 40 to 1 at 80, even 100 knots. So it's, it's a pretty slippery sort of aircraft, whereas the Blanding, once you get above 60 knots, it, it'll start falling out of the sky. So that's the difference between those two. An interesting point is they're gliders, and but they've got conventional controls. And I think in actual fact, gliding, well, it was certainly around before power flight, and were the forerunners of the conventional controls as an, an aircraft now. As I say, the only difference being probably is the coordination of rudder stick. Conse consequently, if one flies a glider, one could fly a powered aircraft if, if you get to that stage. Of course, they've got to be got up in the air. They're essentially gliders. They're always going down, except on tow. Interesting enough, I think that's probably taken down the Sterling Range, isn't it, you chaps? Yeah. That TUG, or Tug, Tango Uniform Golf, is the Narogen Tug aircraft. And that's probably the most efficient, easiest way to get these gliders in there. Put them behind their tug, toss them up. About six minutes to 2,000 feet is what my friend John Kenny who is a tug pilot. And it's ideal. Not only to get them to the right height, also pick up a bit of lift in the, time, in the meantime. It's an interesting one here. That's a K6. And you can see the position of the, of the tow rope there. It's what they call the belly release. Most aircraft will have a nose release, <coughs> and the nose release is ideal behind the tug. But the belly release is needed when there's another form of launching, that is the winch launch or auto launch from the ground, when that will actually go up like a kite. And you can see where that's hooked. When the aircraft gets to its correct height, that can be released quite easily, or very often there's 
a back release mechanism so it will release. There's only one big drawback in that particular case being towed by a tug aircraft if that glider gets too high on, on tow, it can be bad news for the tugging. In other words, it will lift his tail up. Um, so we normally <coughs> launch our gliders in what's called a low tow position. We make sure we blow the tuggy strip steam. I'm not too sure just what would happen if you got too low. The poor old tuggy would stall, presumably, and then would die. It would be much better, though, than if that thing were to go in into a kiting situation with the poor old tug on the ground would just dip his nose in. So that's just an interesting aside with that. The K6 incidentally is one of the older constructions. It's a, it's a beautiful little aircraft. I've flown it. It's just a delight to fly. It only has a glider ratio of about 28 to 1. But it's made of principally wood. I think that one is partly covered with fabric. In the wing. Is, is it a compass construction, John? It's purely wood. That, that raises an interesting point. Now, the early gliders, most of them, post-war anyway, were made like a Tiger Moth. Tubular steel uh, with the fabric covering and the plywood on the leading edge. A very satisfactory way of doing it too. And light. Mm. Yeah, that's a shot of them taking off. It's interesting one enough. <coughs> now this is a, a shot of a the glider ratio, so you can see how that the best glider ratio, 135, is at about 50 knots. I'm not too sure what aircraft it is, but obviously as the speed builds up, so will the rate of dis descent. Uh, in millimeters a minute, that's about 70 it meters per second, a big button, which is roughly 160, 200 feet a minute. That's, that's the descent rate of gliders through the air at any stage. So, to, to go up at all, you, we have to have rising air more than two, 200 feet a minute for a start. Uh, now that rising air, mostly in this part of the world, it's in thermal activity. Uh, nice flat country, you know, this type of thing, willy willies and new power pilots, we power pilots, we like, don't like the things at all, they're rough and horrid. But glider pilots, what we're looking for, life in the air will carry it up. So any lift above 200 feet a minute will take us up. And that's the way we get our height so we can deflate the distances. But interesting enough, that's only one form of lift. And I've been fortunate enough, and most of you glider pilots have too, experienced the other forms of lift. There's sea breeze, convergent sea breeze fronts, and that type of thing, which can be very interesting. In fact, if I've got time, I might talk about a little bit of that in one of my cross countries. Um, that's one. The other one is, oh, um, well, I suppose the most interesting one a lot is, in, is mountain flying. <coughs> and uh, we're very fortunate that shot was the Sterling Range. Um, that's a very interesting one because it provides both ridge lift and Bluff Knoll is a, is a particularly good one, incidentally. Uh, Bluff Knoll, I saw and grew up, and Ellen Speak, three hills in a line provide a barrier and the wind, providing wind, if it happens to be from the northwest, will go up to the top, curl over the bottom, and lo and behold, you go backwards and forwards on the rising, rising air at the ridge. But not only that, when it goes over the top, it curls over and over and over like that, and provides the rotor. And I think we power pilots know you don't really want to be caught in a rotor in mountains. It's going to be damn dangerous. You really can. Uh, but on the other hand, a glider pilot can use it. Because if it's going around like this, one side is going down to heck of a rate. If you happen to be in that, you're in bad news. The other side is rough and horrid, but it can be what we call thermal. In other words, orbit will go up. And uh, it's, it's a fairly tricky one. But once we get to the top of that rotor like that, all the air falling over it goes over it beautifully smoothly. And that's the wave. And that can be shown by lenticularis clouds. You pilots are all familiar with clouds, lenticularis, line up like that. And it is the signpost in the sky. We really just we saw that lenticularis cloud, and that's wave. And that's stable, and that's it can be very strong. As a matter of fact, down those little 
mountains. Some pilots have gained 30,000 feet, which is, I believe, the Australian record is set down there, isn't it? Don't they? Anyway, incidentally, the world record is 47,000 feet. That's so exactly the same thing in the Rockies in America. There's hope eventually that they'll get to 60 or 70,000 feet over the Andes in South America. There, they've got a volcano to, to help them. But I think that, <laughs> the, the, I think glider pilots are aiming for that. If they get the pressure suits or the pressure gliders, they'll do it for it. Anyway, that, that's lift. And um, I think I've spent enough time. Look at those clouds. Is that the sort of clouds we're looking for, incidentally? Because clouds, as I said, are like signposts in the sky. The air is bubbling everywhere. And of course, if we can follow these signposts, so much the better. And if we're going cross country, we go from one cloud to the other. Unfortunately, we haven't got those sort of conditions in our wheat belt. In our, we've got just blue days. Blue days are not as kind. So all we do is bumble along and hope we bumble into them. I know if you're flying over that sort of country in a light aircraft, you know all about them. Anyway, I suppose that, that that's all I need to talk about, the actual mechanisms of gliding. I'd like just to talk about a couple of flights I've done myself, and uh, perhaps it'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about and what we like to do. I suppose at my age I should have more sense, but I, I'm still competitive enough to like to go and take part in the state comps each year. Not only the fact that it, it's damn good flying, but also there's the infrastructure there so that if I outland, I can be picked up with the tug. There's the comradeship and the friendship, which I enjoyed. I've been enjoying for 20 years in Stanley, and I think I enjoy it more each year. It was, well, you can work that out. We're not exactly daddy to them all, I'm granddaddy to most. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I will talk about one aspect of gliding, is the final glide. It really is probably the most important part of a competition glide particularly, but every final glide, we power pilots will know the same thing. You've had a nice, long, enjoyable mm -hmm. flight, you've got enough height to cut the power back, glide home, semi-glide, sit back, relax, put your maps away. You know, it's a very pleasant, pleasant part of flight. In fact, I can think of one particular flight I had comparatively recently. Well, it was actually before the, the Twin Towers copped a lot. I was up in the jump seat of an Airbus 320. Talking to the skipper, he had a farm somewhere near Ararat. We were yakking about farming, and he says, suddenly things went quiet. I said, are we gliding now? He says, yes, yes, we... We're in negative thrust at the moment. Well, for goodness sake, Melbourne was still over the horizon. We could see it. It was a long one. No, it well, Dinky Day, it was a beautiful flight from then on. That jumbo jet, at least that Airbus 320, signed as you like. I don't know whether the pilot was doing it or whether he was being aided by the computers. That wasn't the, that wasn't the point as far as it was concerned. It was a beautiful approach. And eventually, lining up to land, and. The, I don't know, 1,500 feet. The noise came on again. He, the pilot says, we need to spool up now just in case we've got to go around again. You jet pilots know all about that. But anyway, that was, what, that was a beautiful final glide, really. The other one I talked about last time was when we had an engine failure in an Anson aircraft at Geraldton. It was a bit of a cliffhanger. It was the old Aggie with beautiful aircraft that was, would, wouldn't fly very well on one engine. We had enough height, certainly, but... It was just a bit of a nail biter to make sure we made the circuit. That was another one. Um, getting back to the gliding, I have had two final glides at the Cops in Beverly, which I remember quite well. Because one was purely pig headed us on my part. The clouds were at about 14,000 feet. I could see they were high. And any sensible pilot wouldn't get that high, it's just wasting time. The thermals are good and strong, lower down. But now I managed to get to 14,000 feet at Wild Catchem. It took me quite a long while to get there. But from Wild Catchem to Beverly via Corrigan was 98 nautical miles. It 
took me just one hour. I didn't have to turn, I just went from cloud to cloud to cloud, then she came in. It was magic. I thought, oh God, I've got this take one. Oh, no trouble at all. <laughs> I came forth. <laughs> anyway, just the last comps. I think I probably had the worst final glider I've ever had. I was 20 k's out, down to 1,500 feet, and that's too low, really. 1,000 feet is the deadline on cross country. When you get down to 1,000 feet, you must have got your paddock picked. Hopefully it's big enough to be aerotoed out of it, but it's got to be picked so you've got time to do a circuit. That's the discipline of gliding. And in tribute to most of my, to all my glider pilots, they do get it right. Just once in a while there's a rather tragic mistake, but generally speaking, that discipline is there. A thousand foot, right, where's the paddock? Anyway, I was down to 1,500 foot, 20 k's out. It took me an hour to get that last 20 k's against a 20, about a 24 knot headwind. It was blowing hard. There was lift there. So I was fluctuating between 1,500 and 2,000 feet, and I thought, I've just about got it made. I didn't have final glide height until I was 5 k's out at 500 feet. And that was too low, really, because I had to make a straightened approach. But that, was a, that really was a cliffhanger. Anyway, another one I'll talk about, just briefly, and then I'll be out of time. Is a, is a cross country I did in Morawa only a couple of months ago. Uh, about 11 o'clock in the morning, I looked out of the sky and I was not doing anything, David. Oh, gee, those clouds are beautiful. I, I got such a yearn. I've just got to see if I can get a glow. A flight out of this, so I rang up a friend of mine, one of the glider pilots, who lives about 10 miles out of town, this and can you come and give me a launch? Oh, Dick, he said, I'm drenching sheep, or I'm <laughs> drafting cattle or something. I can't get in there till about 2 o'clock, will that do? And I said, well, I'll have everything ready by 2 o'clock, yes, that'll do. I'll make 300 k's, it's such a beautiful day. I wanted to do 300 k's, 300 kilometres, that's, that's more or less a standard short cross country we like to do that just to keep in practice, don't we, here? <laughs> John? Not exactly, but anyway, to cut a long story short, he was later than I expected, I was later. I finally got away at quarter to three. But the clouds were so beautiful, that's what, oh damn it, I'll give it a go. And I wanted to try to see what it was like east of what we call the tiger country from Morrowal. About 20 k's out from Morrowal, we get to the station country, and the Cultivation cuts out, so there's no paddocks. But what, we're, and I've done it before, and we've done it, we follow the roads, we try and stay in gliding range of strips and things. We got, I got out to Carrara in good time, even though there was a, about a 24 knot, a 20, yes, 24 knot southerly blowing. It, it was post frontal, incidentally, part, yes. And uh, it was that sort of day, nice turbulent, clouds showing up. I made good time out there, I probably averaged about 100 k's. 80 k's due east, well over the Tiger country. The clouds were working so very well, I thought, I'll go as far south as I can, even if I don't make 300 k's, I'll go down. Well, you can make fairly good progress if you can follow the streets, one cloud after the other, and you know, they'll line up, they do too, very nicely. But they lined up so well, I got a long way from home. Uh, have a look at the time, Seth. It's half past four. You've got to be joking, you can't get expect terminals of this size again. Better go home. Anyway, what a matter, I had left it late, too late. And I was about 30 or 40 k's away from landing country, I was still over the tiger country. I just got to get back to the road, so at least I can be picked up there. And the road, incidentally, was about, I don't know whether you know that area, but it's north of Woburn, north of Dalwalu, this little township of Maya. Well, I finally got back to a landfall paddock near the road at Mayo at a thousand feet. Where's that paddock? Where's it? Lo and behold, a little bit of, little bit of lift, a little bit of lift. Oh, lovely. Well, what it amounts to is source of lift. Very strong southerly, 24 knots, late in the day, no thermals, but the curl over of the scrub around these town sites. Mayo, Latham, Bunjil, Karen, finally Perengi. Got me from 1,500 to 2,000 each time, round about that. Well, to cut a long story short, at Perengi, it's a bigger town, 
bigger buildings, even a wheat bin, even a strip there if need be, a little bit of nice lift, 4,000 feet. Oh, a lovely final glide in the last 35 was bloody beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's about it, gentlemen. If you'd like to ask me a question about gliding, I'm quite willing to answer, but it's a very much an impromptu talk. Brian said, what was I going to say? I said, well, I'm not too sure, but I'll, I will talk. Uh, with that, thank you for listening to me. Thank you.